Got removed from home at the age of 10, getting pulled up on um, on the breaking and entry and burglary um, at that early age and ending up at the classification block in uh, Paremoremo. You know, it was quite a scary introduction to jail because you'd heard about the place and, 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 and the uh, and the guys that were in there, uh, the work that we do, and a lot of it, while well, all of it is to do with um, service to people, especially those in the margins. Young soldier of God, steady march. Dear Heavenly Father, it's our tour. We just give all the praise to you. Please speak through me and the brother here. We also say a special prayer for all of the brothers and sisters that are incarcerated, all of the brothers and sisters in gangs and things like that. Please bring peace, Father, to, um, to the country across the Motu. In Jesus' almighty and precious name, Homie, Huye, Tariki. Amen. All right, so um, what's your name and where are you from? Yeah, my name is uh, David Letilli. <clears throat> New Zealand born Samoan. My mum and dad, um, you know, one of the first migrations, I suppose. Um, late 40s, early 50s. My dad was here in 1950. Wow, 1953. Yeah. So one of the first, all right, to, to make that move over yeah. far out. What a what a different time that would have been. Yeah, but, sure. But uh Dave, man, the big also Papa Dave here. Uh man, really the, the man <laughs> needs no introduction here. I'm telling you, this guy is um he's a he's a legend. Um we've actually met through a, a mutual church friend of ours, and um we just hit it off ever since there. I've just got so much love for everything that this man does. <clears throat> um really admire the work. So this man is one of the founders of, of Grace Foundation, along with his um with his late daughter and um a few others, you know, they started the Grace Foundation. And um, basically, they just work well. First of all, there's not any other um, organization like it in this country. Uh, uh, me myself, I just didn't even know um, anything like that even existed. Just seeing what the, the USO does here um, in regards to you know rehabilitation, um, getting our brothers and sisters out of prison. You know, the thing that's special with what Dave does here is um, you know they they put they, they they put the word of God with it as well. You know, they, they sort of make uh, God's a, a big part of it. And you can really see that I've, I've sat in the um, the classes and, you know, just awesome facilitators, um, really just people who have walked the path. Dave here himself has walked the path himself. You know, um, Dave, before he was <laughs> doing this Grace Foundation, you know, he grew up uh, a ward of the state. Uh, he was a patched member of the Mungu Mob at 15 Auckland president at 19, uh, man, you know, he was sentenced to 10 years for armed robbery um, in some of the hardest prisons here in New Zealand. And um, just look at what the man's doing now. You know, he's just um, just got so much respect for you, Dave, and, and what you're doing. Um, brother, can you sort of explain what Grace Foundation is, brother, for our viewers in Australia? Um, obviously, that they definitely don't have any programs like that in Australia. You know what I mean? Uh, what you're doing here. So can you sort of explain what services you do provide for people and, and things of that nature, brother? Yes, yeah, you know, you know, uh, we're going into our 17th year now of operation. And um, it's been an up and down journey in terms of um, uh, the work that we do. And a lot of it, well, all of it is to do with um, service to people, especially those in the margins. And as you know, many in the margins are incarcerated. So, um, but the funny thing is that um, when we started this thing, um, we really had no idea what it was going to turn out like. So initially, uh, it was about um, community centre. Um what what I used to call a, a church that don't sleep, you know. And it was a 24-7 thing, idea. But really what it turned out to be was um, this idea of accommodation um, attached with attachments like with rehab and reintegration. And then the prison thing came along, you know. Um, and I think um, I was 46 years of age at the time when I'd actually... Um, turned my life around and had no, uh, really had no idea what it was that God had in store for me going forward. And uh, the opportunity uh, and the, um, you know, the gateway opened in regards to this idea of Grace Foundation. I remember sitting around a table with some guys and, um, and I was asked, you know, what would I, 
what could I see myself doing with what I, you know, with what with the journey that I've just come from? And I'd say, you know, I'd love to help gang members. And not knowing that that was where I was going to end up being, you know. And we slowly but surely uh, got ourselves um, known because uh, initially we were seen to be fly-by-nighters by the likes of corrections, the police, the courts. But um, 17 years down the track, now it's um, they definitely see us as big players in, 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 in regards to what we do, the accommodation, the rehab, the reintegration, uh, the care for people, the genuine care of people. I think at present we're the biggest bailhouse in New Zealand at the moment. Um, we're probably the biggest organisation in regards to gang members. We have we have a lot of clubs represented uh, under the umbrella of Grace. I, I would go as far as saying about ninety percent. Ninety that are either that are either gang members or associated uh, to gangs to uh, to the gangs. The funny uh, the other the, the, the that number wouldn't change with our women folk as well, because they either um, they either got partners that are um, that are patch members or they. They're associated in some way. Yeah, but which is why you know what you're doing is just so much appreciated from so many different people. So so very well respected. You know, um, walking into that first time at um, Papatoi SDA, which uh, the Grace Foundation used for their programs and things, you're just seeing um, just you know, like he's just said, you know, gang members from all of these different clubs, mm -hmm. you know, sitting under one roof though. You know, like these are gangs that would be warring, you know what I mean, out on the streets and things and just being able to sit and, um, you know, just, man, just, you know what I mean, trying to better themselves, you know, yeah. and, and things like that. It's, it's a beautiful thing, Dave. Yeah. So, I mean, well, I guess we'll go, well, we can go into your story for a bit, brother. So, I mean, um, so how was it for you, man? So your parents came here in the 50s, you know, um you know, right at the start of the, the, the migration, I guess. So how, how was it for you growing up? And where did you grow up? Yeah, no, I, um, well, I was born in a, in a what's seen today as a, um, a well-to-do suburb of, of Mount Eden. It's where, you know, all the well-to-do middle class upward, uh, you'd find them around those areas, Mount Eden, working your way through into town. We event, ended up in South Auckland new subdivisions that were going up there, new new housing development that went up there that's turned in. That's where all the uh, Pacific Islanders are now and the Maldives, Maori Pacifica, who were once in the town, in the city, CPD, Ponsonby, Greylin, those all areas that were once um, resident for our, our people, but uh, slowly but surely <laughs> pushed back over the bridge to the south side. Yeah, so... That's where I, I, I was raised in Mangere. Yeah, my mum and dad were, um, my dad in particular was a rigid, you know, really strict um, Seventh-day Adventist. Um, so he actually did a bit of schooling in Samoa. It was a college named Vailoa. Yeah, so they're quite rigid in terms of uh, religion, Christianity, um, more so the religion side. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yes, yeah, so me, myself, I grew up in the in the SDA church as well. You know, my mum was pretty staunch SDA, her mum yeah. and even her mum as well, my great grandmother going back to the island. So, <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, sometimes you can get more religious than actual Christian, isn't it? Isn't yeah, that yeah, the truth, yeah. you know, especially yeah. with the SDA church, though, you know, but yeah. there's something about the SDA church, though. I'm telling you so many, you know, Monia who I've had on the show as well, you know, is SDA and it's just... um. Something about that church eh, really creates some um, soldiers for God. Uh, I'm a believer in. Well, where, where did life sort of head for you from there, brother? So, I mean, obviously you became unfortunately involved with gangs at a pretty young age. So when did that sort of um, start for you? Yeah, I think um, being a Pacific Islander, because there's nine of us, nine siblings, including myself, uh, four brothers, uh, sorry, three brothers, four of me and, um, and five sisters. So, you know, the house was full. I didn't really spend too much time at home once I was able to climb out the window, you know, and um, and just disappeared, you know, for days. But I always come home at night. And, you know, I would have been only young, you know, eight, eight nine years old at the time. And um, 
And eventually, I sort of started. Um, I made up. I met up with some guys who were very like-minded in terms of just being out loose on this, on, on you know, out in the community. And uh, we'd just go and do some silly things, you know, like breaking into stuff. And I don't think there was a school we didn't break into. Funny thing, I always share that uh, the only school we left was the SDA College. <laughs> <laughs> For some yeah. reason, we just I said, "Oh no, I'm not going there," you know. Um, and it just, you know, it just escalated from there, you know. Um, then there was this real um, urge to, uh, to 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 be a gangster. I don't know where that came from, to be honest. You know, I uh, so I'd get, you know just. You know, as a kid, I'd get a jacket and I'll I'll draw something on the back of my jacket and wear it around. You know, so we started a little group which which um, in Mangere there was about a handful of us called the Mangere Dogs. And uh, you know, we had a proper patch and all that set up. We were only kids, you know, and um, and all we do is just did mischief things, you know. Even um, things like going across different suburbs like Otara or um, Papatoi and um, to the rec centres. And I was a bit of a I was a bit of a stirrer, you know. Like I'd start something just out of for the sake of starting something, a fight or something, you know. And then uh, I think around the age of um, 14, 15, that's around the age I met my wife Tui. I don't know what the hell she was doing up here in Auckland because she was from down in Tequiti. Far out. But yep. we, we we bumped into each other through through the gang scene, you know, because um, by then uh, the mongrel mob had arrived into Auckland from Wellington. They had some, um, you know, some head guys turn up. And although they sort of lived up here for a little while, I think the goal was to start it up up here. And uh, it wasn't long after that that um, I found out who they were and um and then you know the the, the journey of the mob started. I, I wanted to um, promote myself from the Mangere dogs to the uh, to the mongrel mob. But um, the funny thing is, the guys that I was with on the on Mangere dogs, because I was saying to them, we should we should step up. But no, they didn't want to because they said, oh no, they're too serious. So during this time, so this is when the mongrel mobs actually started here in Auckland. So you were yeah. basically one of the yeah. originals. Well, I, I I would have come over, come come in just just a little after they had actually started, you know. But they were still forming eh, at the time. Um, but mainly from they were like imports. Mm, yeah. You know. Yeah. So yeah. So just recruiting. Uh, yeah. So how how were the next couple of years for you, and um, you know, mm. and then making you know president and things like that? How how were those next couple of years for you? Yeah, no, I just, um, I just think I was just the right place at the right time for those, um, for you know where I ended up. Um, there was a lot of things that went on in in the in, the, in between. Um, when I was uh, about seventeen, uh, made sergeant of arms. Then, you know, basically the troublemaker. You see, and. Um, what you call it wasn't long after that that uh, there was a lot of tr trouble brewing between the clubs. In the main, it was mainly black power in the mob. Uh, there was also a, um, a strong presence from the headhunters, but there was also presence. Uh, there was also uh, the Highway Sixty Ones. Um, the stormtroopers were there. Um, the Forty Fives in Tuckanini. Um, the Hells Angels were around, you know, Angels were around. But in the main, it was the, in terms of the warring, was, um, there was a time there where we were, we were kind of allied with the, uh, there was a small period there where we were allied with the headhunters. Uh, there was a bit of a MOU there, you know, <laughs> and, um, and there was a lot of trouble brewing between, uh, um, between the, the, the Black Power Cindy group mainly the Cindy, uh, a, uh, a Fariwaka was the, um, was the head man at the, uh, during that time. I don't know if you've known of uh, a Fariwaka. I heard of him. I don't know him, but heard of him. Yeah, no, he was, um, 
he's passed away now. He's passed now, but he was um, very old school. You know, there's a lot of the mischief in between, you know, the um, the hits uh, between the two groups. Um, a lot of drinking, you know, a lot of um, a lot of drug taking, a lot of um, a lot of abuse of women. Um, and I'm saying that because the, the the mob had that kind of reputation of um, of uh, having women second, you know, second class. And then at the age of 19, I see I'd already met Tui then. I had my young, I don't know if you know my young fella, the Butterbean. Yeah. yeah. He, um, yeah, so he was, at 19, we had him. One of the uh, reasons that uh, with the uh, the role of president um, at 19 was that there, there was a, um, there was an incident that took place uh, between the clubs, which almost wiped the mob out in terms of numbers. And um, it didn't leave many of us out here. So it basically took charge from Sergeant of Arms because the um, the president at the time had um, been locked, you know, was part of the group that got locked away. So um, hence, hence uh, you know, the, um, the speedy <laughs> pr promotion to... Uh, and it's not like something you really sort of want, you know? Yeah, it was just yeah. you just had to take it, at a, you know, quite not long after, which my like twenty two, that I um ended up with a ten year prison term. All right, so I mean, man, what what a story up till that point though, you know, being involved in gangs from such a young age. You were also a ward of the state, weren't you? I mean, I've yeah. I've heard the I've heard the horror stories coming through there. Obviously, there's a royal royal commission going on uh, currently into into yeah. you know what's been going on in in those spaces. So I definitely hear it's no walk in the park. Um, I basically gang I hear that gangs were basically formed because of places like that. You know, but yeah. because of because of those yeah. institutions. <clears throat> well, you know, I um I got put away. I got removed from home at the age of ten. Um, not only because I kept getting pulled up on um, on the breaking and entry and burglary um, at that early age, but um, and then the the, 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 the straw that broke the back was um, the camel's back was um, was was burning half a school down. <laughs> oh no! It's not funny now. Sorry, it, you know when I think about it, it's not funny back then. You know because when I think about it now, you know I said that was such a silly thing to do. But um, it was just the, my mindset at the time, you know. It was just seek and destroy. <laughs> and um, part of that was just vandalism, you know. So um, I got removed from home uh, at that age, 10, and uh, I didn't come back home to about 12, 13. So there wasn't much schooling after that. I went to a well-known uh, boys' home. That uh, See, back then, the boys' homes were quite big institutions. They weren't homes as such. You know, like the Grace Homes, they're not like that. These were these were basically mini prisons. So um, the one I went, the well known one up here was Oweraka Home, boys home. So it housed about between thirty to sixty guys. Um, they even had a secure block, you know, <laughs> that resembled a pound, you know, prison pound. I was there for a few months, and then they shipped me down to a place in Levin called Hokio Hokio Beach School. And that's one of the places, including Oaraka, that's mentioned a lot with the abuse cases. Yeah, I've heard of and, it. And um, yeah. you really have to be strong to survive those places, you know, have put a front on, you know. And I would have been uh, maybe one or two of us that were islanders, you know. And um, so I witnessed a lot in terms of, uh, see, with the, there's a thing they call new spankers. These are new people that come into the, you know, into the boys' home, into the institution. And they, you know, they initiate them, you know. So what they do is they wait till dark time at a time when the housemasters ain't watching and they'll throw a blanket of you over you and beat the hell out of you, you know. But I've often wondered, you know, as I've traveled through these places on my journey, that I came out of it unscathed. None of that was done to me, you know. And I, I often reflect back on um, 
on some of you know some of their journey, you know. And and I can only put it down to God protecting me throughout the throughout the journey. Yeah. You know. So you've ended up in prison. So um <clears throat> and then I guess that's another experience there, you know. So I mean, you know, so you've ended up at at, at um at Parry, you know. So yeah. I mean you've got to grow up again now, you know what I mean? And yeah. You know. <laughs> you had to grow up real quick, you know, because you're still just coming out of, you know, we're still coming out of being a TJ, teenager, really. Um, but, you you know, we'd heard so much about this place, you know, and ending up at the classification block in uh, Parimorimo, you know, it was quite a scary introduction to jail because you'd heard about the place and and and, and the uh, and the guys that were in there, you know, all the heavy-duty dudes, you know, that were in there. And... Um, yeah, it was. Uh, you had to sort of, really sort of, yeah, be strong and because um, you know that first night I'll never forget it in in, in the fetal position when that cell door closed. Eh? no one can see, but you know you can't help but get in that fetal position and have a have a bit of a cry. You know, what the hell have I done here? You know, and I I reckon no matter how tough a person is. I guarantee they 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 recognise the uh, that fetal position. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so I mean, well, in their, so, in their time. so 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 how, how how was it for you um, in there? You know, I guess those initial years, like, did your reputation sort of carry from the outside at all? Did you know people in there? Or yeah, no, yeah, no, I um, yeah, definitely knew uh, people in there. Uh, we knew that uh, one of the blocks in, in Paremoremo was a dedicated block to the mob. There's 48 units in a block. And um, so we were in the classification block and we knew we were going to end up in this block, B block. It's a well-known block. Um, everybody knows during that time. But it just so happened the time we had gone in there, um, 83, 84, there was actually uh, a power struggle between the mob and the headhunters. So the headhunters were in A block and we were in B block. So, you know, it was, uh, you know, just to walk in there and then already you're walking into some some trouble. <laughs> so um, by the time we got over to B block, I was, you know, I was taken aback a bit because of the, the sheer numbers of uh, the mob that were in there, you know. We fooled the whole block. There might have been one or two guys there that weren't associated to the mob directly, but the rest were mob members, you know. And um, yeah, so settled in quite quickly. And um, it was also seen uh, not long after, um, you know, as, as one of the leadership there in the, in the block. And um, you know, there was guys from all over the Motu, all over the, um, from all over Aotearoa that were there or from the mob. So that was a plus, you know, just getting to know, know different guys from the different clubs, uh, different uh, chapters. And um, yeah, no, uh, that, that during, when, when we got there, the place was still open. Like we could still, um, mixed with the other blocks but after the uh there was a there was a riot there that involved the mob and the headhunters um we nearly lost uh, i think three guys there you know got hurt really bad we, we nearly almost lost them uh one i think today is uh still still with head damage um punctured lungs on the another so that's where it started in terms of um they they then segregated all the blocks so they weren't they weren't allowed to get moved around without um, them making sure because we got this long we call used to call it the airstrip, which is you got all the blocks along along this long landing. So that was the start of a very boring jail because because <laughs> <laughs> we were all segregated into the blocks and there was no movements unless you know. So. Um, I sort of really grew, um, I grew a little there, but then I, I come to um, a point where I, I, I wanted to grow in terms of um, 
I wanted to meet other people, so I asked for a transfer to Christchurch. That's where I ended up. And I, you know, here's my thinking. Oh, you know, the, and then I get down there, and who do I walk into? <laughs> <laughs> it's the mob again, you know. So I just realised, you know, it doesn't matter where I went, the jails, um, you know, there's going to be the the mob's going to be there, and um, and just so. Yeah, just I think every um, every jail I went to in terms of mob, I um, yeah, basically seen as as part of the leadership straight away sort of thing, you know. But wow. um, very different role in regards to um, my way of thinking at the time, you know. It was really about um, collaboration um, with others. Um, it was really about you know just do our legs. There was no real rehabilitation in the jail. I ended up in Turangi, a place called Hautu. That was the prison camp. I did the the, the bum end on my leg there. I, I went back to the boys when I got out. I um, went back to them for maybe a couple of years before I um, made a call that I, you know, oh. I didn't see any progress in regards to my um, my stay there. And plus, my mindset had changed, you know. But my behavior was still a little bit off <laughs> as to some of the activities I continued to do uh, under the radar. Um, so I got into a lot of drug dealing after that. And also um, I had a love for hydroponics, you know, in terms of um, growing, growing weed. Um, I had gardens all over Auckland including uh, a couple of warehouses and um, wow, right. a lot of it was just just a one-man band you know but when I say gardens all over Auckland I would um, I would eye up families that were uh, finding hard to make ends meet and I would offer my services if they gave me one bedroom and if they gave me one bedroom I would give them half so that's how I operated back in the day in terms of um, making ends meet on my end and uh, and of course, my little brother, who was also um, because of me, become become a, a mob member. Um, Seventeen years of age, he was in Parry with me. Um, very young, probably one of the youngest around at the time. Um, wow! So he's got an incredible quite, testimony. So he's with Grace Foundation yeah. as well. So incredible yeah. testimony he's got. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you were actually in prison with him as well. Yeah, he come in uh, a little later, and um, yeah, no, I was really, um, I felt really guilty when he came in, because I still saw him as the baby of the family, and I was mm. just saying, bloody hell. So I parked him next to me, up in the, <laughs> up in the landing, <laughs> and um, I left him behind when I got transferred to Christchurch, but um. Yeah, he had, he 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 was quite a. Um, a merciless um, operator. There was there was no words mixed with him. You know, he was. That's how he led. You know, um, it was just action. So you've ended up coming home from prison. You know, you've you've ended up running with the mob for a couple more years. You've obviously handed the patch in, but just continued without the patch. You know what I mean? As a lot of people do. Yeah. So, I mean. Um, so when did when did it all start changing for you? You know, obviously, you know, you're yeah. dealing, you've got these houses, the money's coming in, you know. Um yeah. how, when when did it all start changing for you, man? Yeah, no. Um yeah, it started to change when I started to get around the uh towards the the mid forties of my age. And um and and just watching what was happening to my own family, my my children. And also my lady Tui, um, I did. I just started asking questions of life itself, and um, I was here the uh, in the hydroponic shop because I owned um, I owned two hydroponic shops in Auckland, and uh, also I got into uh, bikes, you know, um, bicycles. Oh, okay. I just went and learned how to be, be a bicycle mechanic. And then um, started to import bicycles from China and um, had this big warehouse selling cheap bikes, you know, but a lot of it was front, you know, just to cover stuff that was coming in on the other side, you know. 
And, um, yeah, and I, I just uh, had a childhood um, friend who, who was a pastor, grew up with him through the church, you know, when we were young. Um, he would always um, sort of just pop in for a visit. Uh, I even took him to one of my gardens. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and he's a pastor, you know, because he just we just knew each other like that, you know. And um, but he was going to America and uh, to further his study. He's now a doctor, you know, in theology. Uh, very powerful preacher, very powerful. Um, he dropped me a box of tapes. It was a series of about 30 cassette tapes on um, a guy, I don't know if you know of him, uh, C.D. Brooks, old school. And I decided after listening to that, that I would listen to one tape a day for the month because it was 30, 30 cassettes. It blew my mind, eh? I, I then came to the realization um, who Jesus was. Because, you know, we're introduced into a Jesus, um, a more religious one. Not this Jesus that was open armed, um, loving, unconditional. Um, yeah, so after listening to those tapes, um, yeah, I decided right there and then that uh, that was it. You know, it was just that how quick it happened after that. You know, I, I wanted to get baptized, but I also still had to hide it because uh, I didn't want my missus to know, you know, what was going through my head, you know. But this one thing happened to me when I was sitting in the house. My lady came, um, said, oh, something all right? You all right? Because, you know, I, and I, I couldn't stop it. I just burst out in tears. But it was a funny cry. It was one of those uncontrollable type cries. Wow. It was just like, that was it, you know? So um, funny, uh, good thing about it, my lady just got went quiet and just, just sat down with me, you know? And I just told her, I said, um, there's some things I'm going to stop doing, you know? I need to stop doing. And my, my little brother that would, uh, he would come into the shop on a weekly basis, drop me off about 20, 30 grand at a time. You know, and I he'll come in and I uh, that last time and I said, bro, I don't want this money anymore. There's a lot of blood on that money. I don't want it. Don't wow. don't bring it to the shop no more. And he he told me later that it was like he'd been uh, I had divorced him because <laughs> we're so close, you know. And um, and he just he, he was he said he was so heartbroken. And I think another thing that took place too that really cemented the change was my dad falling ill uh, to Alzheimer's, and um, and the decision made that I I was going to I'll go home and look after him, having to go back to take care of the man that I caused a lot of heartache to. You know, when I think back on the years of uh, where the shame I brought up, you know, brought up bestowed upon him. You know, yeah. So um. <clears throat> Those five years I took care of Dad, eh? uh, right to his last breath, I promised him uh, that I would never put him in a rest home. I had uh, a lot of, still had a lot of that dirty money, you know, and I'd done up uh, his shower so that the wheelchair could fit in there. Um, got him electric, uh, proper electric um, hospital bed, hoist, everything. Had his room uh, almost like a hospital room, wow. smelling like a hospital room. And, um, Washed them, you know, just washed them day and night. In the morning, give them a wash. You know, it got worse when when he became incontinent. You know, where he he, he really all his body functions weren't working anymore, and and there were things there that you would never have dreamed that you'd do for for your dad. You know, and here the here the black sheep was doing it. You know, <laughs> yeah. And I was so so protective over him too. Over as time passed, I wouldn't do it for certain people. I wouldn't let come in. Because I knew they were just coming in for a nosy, but some of his um, old friends I'd let in, you know, to come and visit him, especially as his mind started to deteriorate. Because he he started swearing and he got quite a, quite aggressive, you know. Oh. Um. So I remember the last day when he took his last breath, I was shaving him, you know. And um, on that day, because I called in the family from overseas, Australia, Samoa to come, I said, Dad's, Dad's almost there. And I had all the grandchildren, the boys, I think it was about four of them, while I shaved them. 
And I think it was a really good experience for them, you know. They got an insight in terms of uh, what it is that we did for the last five years with Dad, you know. And just as I was shaving him, he took his last breath, you know. But it was uh, that basically was the uh, the nail for me, you know. And um, I knew from there that I wasn't I'm in this thing for for the rest of my life, you know. Her grace hadn't been formed at the time, but it wasn't long after, you know. That I I got rid of all the stuff too. The bikes got rid of them. The cars got rid of them. Wow. And um, even the house that we were in got rid of it. Yeah, funny, eh? God will strip you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. During that time when I was really seriously considering this idea of Christianity, you know, there were a lot of questions going through my mind, you know. Is this real, you know? Is this thing real, you know? So, I, you know, I do a lot of Google, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of Google stuff and yeah. go to the evolution, go to Christianity, Google and weigh it up uh, as you know i mean i just came to the um conclusion that hey you know, there's only one real explanation for us yeah that makes sense that makes you know? sense yeah yeah it's as simple that, as uh, that there must be a designer there must be a designer because when you look at yourself each day in the mirror you know it's a miracle Every time I look at the mirror, even when I just see those documentaries, especially in the ocean, you know, and I see all God's creation down there, and I'm just like, yeah. how could you think anything else than someone's actually created all of this? You know, it's too perfect. Yeah. You know, like there yeah. just it's there's yeah. been some magical explosion billions of years ago. I mean, that takes the faith to believe in that, isn't it? <laughs> that takes a lot of faith to believe that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, well, um, look, so, so you've ended up starting Grace. So, um, man, that must have been a challenge, even that, you know, working with, um, you know, <clears throat> working with the people that you work with and things. I mean, that must have just been a huge learning curve in itself. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, as you know, um, you know, we don't hammer it, you know, we don't hammer the, uh, the, uh, the faith side. Because yeah. we understand, you know, that um, it's really about the action, the love and action. And I think that's what God did in re reflection in terms of, uh, you know, how he um, He equips you and gets you ready. Because you don't know what's coming, but he does. Eh? Yeah, that's right. So, um, so, you know, by the time we got into the grace and it started to really roll, um, you know, he'd already equipped us or equipped me, you know, in terms of the compassion, the love that's required, no judgment, um, love no matter what. Um, and, and then to give us a name like Grace. Yeah, love know, that the name. Idea that, you know, the idea that we don't even deserve the chance, eh? <laughs> yeah, but he'll give right. it anyway. I mean, you test it all the time, eh? Because you get some guys that will test you to the max. Mm. And the attitudes that come with it, the baggage they bring, yeah. the trauma they have, you know, in their lives. Um, and that's what I always say when, when you get attitudes like that, I'm just thinking of where they've come from. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then, you know, that suddenly puts a, you know, puts a, uh, a lid on any other faults. Eh? I'm really privileged to be doing what I, you know, I do the, today. It's it, That's it. It's my life. I, dedicated the rest of my life to it look so we're we're sort of coming to the end here now brother i've really enjoyed this time um speaking with you um man it's just you know ever since i met you you know i i wanted you on the show at 100 you know i'm looking forward to, to seeing what the future holds for us you know i i definitely um like I said, you know, with what you guys do and, and helping prisoners, for me, that's just so important, you know, getting our brothers and sisters out of there. Um, I'll also leave um, Grace Foundation's Facebook and um, uh, contact details and things like that in the description or in the comments. So um, if you know anyone that's sort of in prison or going through the court system who could maybe benefit from the Grace Foundation, um, you can reach out to them and, and, and contact them um but yeah brother thank you again for jumping on the show brother any sort of last um any last remarks brother before we wrap this up 
Yeah, no, just the uh, yeah, just thank you, Dave, for the opportunity to uh, share. Um, but also, uh, yeah, just be on behalf of Grace Foundation and the and and uh, the men and women. As you know, we also got a mums and bubs home now. Uh, it's actually an apartment building, you know. <laughs> That's crazy, so, um, isn't it? Yeah. So, so yeah. you guys are housing mothers and and their children. Yeah. So it's just reconnecting them with their children through Oranga Tamariki or um, some some have come self referrals, but mainly from the jails and MSD. Um, and then there's the woman's home that we have, the Silit Bail House down in Stanley Street. Awesome. Yeah. No, definitely yeah. exciting times we're in. I, I, I feel just God's moving mountains at the moment. I just really feel it in the air. You know, there's a revival happening. You know, he's just bringing, um, he's yeah. bringing us all together. Again, you know, thanks for jumping on the show. I appreciate it. Again, I'll leave the, the um, links in the description if you want to get in contact with the Grace Foundation, especially surrounding women. If you know any wahine that would benefit the Mums and Bubs program that they're doing, um, just reach out and... Um, if they can prov provide anything for you, I'm, I'm sure they will. So again, also thank you for your time, and um, we'll speak soon anyway. We'll we'll catch up. Yeah, no, we'll do.